Welcome back. I hope that you are all refreshed. As some of you may have seen on social media, Alexei Navalny has offered a few remarks and observations on our conference, handwritten from prison. You can see, perhaps, a sample of what he's written. Perhaps not. Um, he notes that it has helped the opposition in Russia to organize, but it has also helped Vladimir Putin mute democratic voices. We'll have more during our discussion on social media war and democratic values. And now I'm told, yes, here are his handwritten notes by Navalny to us from prison. Here to moderate the next panel is Anna Herhausen. She is executive director of the Alfred Herhausen Society. Please welcome her and her panel. Anna. Thank you very much, Jean, and also from my side, welcome to this panel on social media, war and democratic values. My name is Anna Haus, and I'm executive director of Alfred Herhausen Gesellschaft, and we've been working with the Alliance of Democracies Foundation on a number of projects in the past few years. Uh, just last year, for example, we uh, co-created a public information campaign on the dangers and threats of dis information during the federal election um, in Germany. So for me, this is a welcome continuation of our collaboration. On the panel uh, here with me are Michael Chertoff. Michael is co-founder of the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity. He's, of course, also a former US Secretary of Homeland Security and founder of the Chertoff Group, a management consultancy that advises companies um, on all kinds of risks from cyber to uh, geopolitics and uh, many more of these challenges that we're facing today. Um, joining us virtually from Germany is Marina Weisband. Marina is co-chair of D64, Center for Digital Progress, a members organization in Germany. She's also the lead of a project called Aula, where students, teachers, and parents are supported to jointly bring school to the digital age, co-creation and empowerment here being the key aspects, I would say. And last but not least, as a German-Ukrainian publicist and politician, she is well known uh, to many of us in Germany, especially in the last yeah, three months, more than three months, uh, she's appeared widely on television, explaining to us, commenting uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Welcome, Marina. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, again, here on the podium, we have Markus Reinisch. Markus is Vice President of Public Policy for Europe, Middle East and Africa for META. Meta, of course, not only being a supporter of uh, this summit here, but being the parent company for Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram, and also for Reality Labs, uh, the division of the company where the technology for the metaverse is being developed. Thank you very much, Markus, for being with us. Before we start the panel, I would also like to uh, remind you that, of course, active audience participation is encouraged, so you can post uh, questions to the panel and to Marina via uh, the conference app, and I will receive them here on my iPad and try to integrate them into the conversation. To kick off this panel, um, in a minute, we will hear from Vice President of the European Commission, Vera Jourova. She's Vice President for Values and Transparency and in that function coordinates, for example, the EU Democracy Action Plan, or um, she monitors the implementation of the Code of Practice on Disinformation. So uh, very fitting, and we're very grateful to um, have her kick off this panel in a way. She very much regrets that she's not able to be here in person, but I was uh, um, able to speak to her a couple of days and pose 
two questions and maybe we can have the responses uh, gotten ready. The first question is, will Europe lead on global tech regulation or is big tech too big for democracy? And this is what Vice President Jourova had to say to that. Yes, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me and, and for your interest. Uh, uh, well, I think it is quite clear that Europe is leading on tech uh, regulation now. We already have the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act. We have a proposal for transparency of political ads regulation. And uh, as we speak, we are now finalizing the work on the anti-disinformation road. And it's clear the times uh, of the digital wild West are over and the old Facebook slogan move fast and break things is out of date and we don't want digitalization to break democracy and we work against such a development. On the contrary, we want the people to benefit from the digital transition, but we need to address the risks. What is illegal offline must be illegal online. And digital platforms have revolutionized the ways we communicate and engage with each other. They increasingly facilitate our own uh, interactions, whether at home, work or school, for news and entertainment, uh, to shop and trade, to connect and communicate, to learn and to express opinions. So I have also the words of appreciation and we want to go digital in Europe, but do it in a safe way. Um, where we see the risk is, uh, for instance, that digital ads uh, uh, a stress test for democracy. Simply, uh, we see that for democracy, there are several very risky paths uh, already taken, and we, we have to stop this, this development. Uh, because we see democracy is fragile and needs constant nurturing. Democracy had problems before the digital revolution, but there are some new trends that digitalization and especially big platforms amplified. This is why we came with our regulatory interventions to address these risks. And there are many abuse of data protection, segmentation of society, and pushing us harder into information bubbles, undermining the media or disinformation. Therefore, we need a whole of society approach. We never believed that some regulation will uh, solve all the problems. We need the society to understand what's happening. We will not be able to regulate every aspect of digitalization, and nor should we. We should invest in education, media literacy, strengthen civil uh, participation, make our democracy more resilient. And since 2020, the EU has a comprehensive plan called European Democracy Action Plan to address these complex issues. And we are now implementing it. Uh, I would like to thank all uh, who got involved on European, national or local level, because this European Democracy Action Plan, uh, uh, we, we have open arms and we call uh, uh, on everyone to cooperate. Democracy needs champions and defenders everywhere, not only in the European Commission or among the European regulators. And then I was able to ask one follow-up question, namely, Looking at the global disinformation war, how can Europe and its democratic partners win against autocracies like Russia or China? How to win against autocracy, uh, China, Russia? Uh, we must be better in democracy. And we are a democracy. We cannot restore ourselves to authoritarian methods to fight with authoritarian regimes. We have a European way in full respect of our fundamental rights and freedoms. For instance, freedom of expression uh, is a core value of the European Union. And disinformation is so dangerous because it uses our freedoms against us. We have a stark reminder of this with Russia's war in Ukraine. And last week I had a chance to speak to Brad Smith from Microsoft and 
to Nick Clegg from Facebook, we talked uh, how, about how to address harmful content, including disinformation online. There are big differences between these two companies, uh, but the conversation on these risks uh, has matured in recent years. And one thing is clear, we all need to do more. And online actors must be more responsible. We need a multi-stakeholder and joint approach. And I believe this is a democratic way to address the risk. First of all, we be naive. It's about bringing rules to the online world. Rights need to be respected online as they are online. Online platforms will have obligations and accountability. And we are opening up their black boxes to researchers and fact checkers. We have a very fresh European law, the already mentioned Digital Services Act, and we are now finalizing the anti-disinformation code. The new code will include a much more detailed set of commitments from online platforms to fight online disinformation and a new monitoring system. We are stopping platforms and websites from making money from misinformation. They must design and deliver better ways to deal with manipulation, bots and fake accounts. Moreover, the Digital Services Act contains a crisis protocol that will be useful to address situations such as the one provoked by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We are also enhancing the EU's and member states' capacity to address foreign disinformation, developing new instruments that will allow for imposing costs on perpetrators, such as malicious foreign actors. The time of innocence on this is over, especially since the war in Ukraine. And yes, I strongly believe we should not work only in the EU on this but within an alliance of global democracies. Transatlantic ties should be a good start. European and American democracies are different, but many problems we face are very, very similar. It makes sense to work together and work out similar solutions as we started doing in the Trade and Technology Council. And I am going in a few weeks to the US to discuss these matters further. But don't worry, I am back in Brussels now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vice President Jourova. And Marcus, uh, since she actually referred to Facebook twice, I'm going to give you the first question. Um, and that is simply uh, with this regulation soon coming out of the EU, will Meta implement these new rules across the board? Yeah, thanks, Anna, for having me first. And, and the short answer is yes. And maybe as a quick response to Vice President Jourova, I, I, I will not apologize for moving fast. I, I think the, the breaking things is a bit outdated and harking back to a theme of a, of a bygone time. I think that Meta is really building for the long-term impact. And, and otherwise, we wouldn't have an organization of about 40,000 people that keep users safe, that fight misinformation, that fight disinformation, that spends around $5 billion every year to do this, which is, by the way, equivalent to the revenues of, of, uh, of Twitter. And I'm also very heartened that she recognizes the here now, the cooperation, the constructive work that we have done as platforms, that we have done as Meta, to work towards these new frameworks. You know, it's the alphabet soup of the EDUP, DSA, DMA, and so on is an absolute milestone. It's one of the most audacious, most complete pieces of digital frameworks that we have globally, and it will, will definitely affect other regions as well. So I think this is an extremely important tool for us. Um, we obviously will comply with, the, with, the, uh, with these measures, and it is really helping to finally do things that we've done already, like the moderation of content, put it on a legal foundation, which was not existent for, for a long time, that we have competition laws that create investment environments, that create, create predictability in an equitable and, and competitive way. But, but I think this is an enormous milestone, but the proof is in the pudding. We still will have to see how it works out, how it is implemented, and I think as a, as a European, 
the yardstick that, that we should apply is, will we have digital single markets? Or will we have fragmentation and national protectionism? Will we have a vibrant European tech technology and, 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 and system? Or will we protect our local incumbents? And will we stop having private companies making these really, really difficult decisions, this balance between democratic and societal values of privacy, of safety, of freedom of speech, and, and I think that's where these tools really come in and help us to create as a, this, this legal basis for it. So a welcome development from a European side, as a European, a welcome development to have these tools from, from a meta perspective as well. Thank you very much for this comprehensive answer, and um, I would like to bring in Marina um, right away. When you hear this, um, on the one hand, the regulatory initiatives and then uh, the big platforms uh, welcoming this very much, vowing to comply, does that put your mind at rest? Do you think uh, disinformation in the medium term future will cease to be a threat? Well, no, of course not. And um, we heard how much you spend in content moderation, and that is good. It's just the question of how much you spend in lobbying against these laws. Um, but my main beef isn't even with Meta or the other big companies. I Do they do enough against uh, disinformation? Probably not right now. They have improved in the past years. Um, but my main question is why why must they do so much against misinformation? Uh, yes, they, these companies need to change to um, have uh, to be able to perform this huge power they hold. But why do they hold this huge power in the first place? Why are our democratic agoras, why are our democratic forums privately owned companies? We cannot say, oh, Meta, you do so little for being a free democratic platform, because that's not what Meta is. That's not what it's paid to be. It needs to be a corporation that makes money. And so it will always sell advertising or it will find another way to sell money. And when we ask ourselves, why are the most outrageous things pushed to the top? It is so advertisers can sell more advertisements. And that's not Meta's fault. That's not Google's fault. That's our fault. Because as a society, we said, you know what? Our public spaces in the digital realm are privately owned. And as states, we don't care. Um, and what the DSA does is, yes, it enhances their responsibility. And that is good. But on the other hand, it uh, gives way to private courts where public courts should take effect and where democratically elected leaders and, and laws should be more present. We basically, we let private companies decide everything that should be democratic and should be in the user's hands. And I'm not even talking about the states, I'm talking about the users. I'm dreaming of platforms that belong to us, the users. Thank you very much uh, for this perspective. Um, I would like to ask a, a follow-up question, um, taking us also to this big topic for this panel, and that is war. Um, because you have also been someone who has been warning that uh, something like the Russian invasion of Ukraine from February was imminent. You have been warning about this for quite some time. Um, what were the signs that you saw on social media that perhaps many of us didn't see or didn't want to see? This war has been prepared very publicly, both on social media and on Russian state TV, and I did nothing more than just watch and read that. Um, first of all, on Russian state TV, people have been prepared to attack Ukrainians. Uh, Ukrainians have been dehumanized publicly. Um, there's been public talk about attacking the Baltic states or even Berlin. Um, Russian propaganda machinery has been very open about this, and it has been for eight, over eight years now. 
And the second thing is the social media army <laughs> Putin's trolls have been targeting every journalist, um, me also, since 2013-14, when we started to report from the Maidan. Um, and they have been targeting me so bad that in 2015 I actually had to leave Twitter due to all the uh, rape and death threats that I have been receiving on a regular basis. So um, when you look at how this operates, it's a very dangerous mechanism because the Russians have understood how social media interacts with the classical mass media and how they um, influence our debate is they basically have 300 trolls that they pay. Um, all of them have about 50 accounts and they go to Twitter where the journalists are and they uh, perpetuate a narrative like it's all Nazis in Ukraine or Ukraine is so um, and so. And then the journalists see this and they think it's part of the grassroots discourse. So when uh, a talk show is designed, they will invite people from both sides and they will include this purely Russian narrative. It's astroturfing. And um, I don't think our media has realized this yet. And I don't see strategies from ministries um, to to counter that. Thank you very much. And then I would uh, like to bring in you, Michael, from uh, your perspective, also very fresh perspective uh, in the United States, from the United States. How do you assess, uh, how does that resonate uh, with you, what Marina just said? And, uh, and if it does, uh, what can we do about it? <clears throat> well, I, I think Marina said some very interesting and important things, but one thing I would underscore she talked about how the regular media amplifies what's on social media. And so I'd like to step back for a minute and make sure we don't act as if what's going on now is something new under the sun. We've had propaganda, we've had disinformation, we've had information operations probably for as long as human beings have existed. Certainly in the last hundred years, going back to this common turn with the Soviet Union, we saw Soviet propaganda that made false accusations against the West or where the leadership of the Soviet Union lied to its own people. So this is not in a, something that is new in kind. Um, it may be new in the way it's actually applied. But even the fragmentation issue, I can tell you I'm speaking obviously from the vantage point of being an American. Um, we, you know, years ago, we had very limited numbers of media channels. And therefore, they had to curate what they put out to appeal to a broad audience. But then we got cable television, and we got talk radio, and all of a sudden, to underscore Marina's point that it's about making money through advertising, the media decided that they could focus on particular sub-segments and still make a lot of money with advertising so that it became possible if you were, for example, ideological, to simply ingest your news from a news organization that you knew would simply repeat the kinds of things you believe in. So again, we've had that segmentation going forward. And finally, the other thing I would caution about um, is being precise about what do we mean when we say disinformation. Um, you know, I think about it, I think about and it's not just misrepresentations, but I think about what used to be called information operations. So for example, incitement. If you're telling people to go out and commit a mass shooting like we've regrettably seen in the US, that strikes me as, as it's not really disinformation, it's just trying to actually get people to do bad things. There's operational falsehoods, telling people the wrong address to go to to vote, so they miss the opportunity to vote or saying that if you drink bleach, that will cure your COVID, it'll kill you. So those kinds of things you want to stop. But a lot of what we talk about with disinformation are simply opinions that are distorted or that we don't agree with, but that it's hard to predict or, or, or to propose an absolute refutation because it is a matter of judgment and inference and argument. And that's really the core of free speech. So I think that as we talk about regulating, certainly when it comes to content, we need to be clear about what are areas of content we can really put off limits. Mm -hmm. We do that with child pornography or incitement to violence. 
and what are some where we can flag or we can put counter arguments out, but we don't want to shut down if we believe in free speech. And then I'd say there are two features that surround social media that we really can do something about. One is, as, as Marina said, the social segmentation um, and the very, very curated, directed uh, messaging to individuals, which allows people to craft messages that won't be seen by other people, so you can really play to a very, very small audience over the entire uh, world. And the second thing we, I think we can do something about is the use of data that is now accumulated um, and being used as a way of micro-targeting what messages will inflame or emotionally engage the user. Because that's what drives up the likes and the, and the uh, engagement elements, which is part of the business model. So I think we need to address this. My caution is not to overreact, to always ask the question, if we do this, what's going to wind up being the unintended consequence? And then again, to go in a deliberate way that understands we can't cure everything we disagree with, but at least mitigates those features of what's going on that has allowed this kind of information operation to become weaponized in, a, in an environment where we do have conflict. Thank you very much. I want to um, bring this point on information uh, and opinion um, back to you in a minute, uh, Marina, but I want to first take a question here from uh, the audience, and I assume it is for you, Marcus. The question is, do you think we can implement an EU regulation which will transfer some of the marketing budgets from social media companies to local and national media? What's your take on that? So this is a question whether um, there should be subsidies for, for publishers, I assume. Is that, um, that, that's it's underneath it. So look, there is a, there's a, a, a legislation already in place, which is the copyright law, um, which legislates the copyright of publishers' content, but also other creative content, and that is exactly what is in the implementation phase in Europe. So this, this does exist already, um, where the so-called value gap is, is bridged. Um, what uh, you have countries like Germany, France, uh, and others where, where this actually has happened already, where the implementation is already closed, and it's going on in other countries uh, as we're speaking right now. Uh, and it's the question about fair remuneration for, for, for news content, for example, on, on Meta. Um, just as a as I, news is a very, very small percentage of of what you as a user see on the matter platforms, both of them in their case and social media platforms, uh, it's under 4% and actually declining. So it's, uh, it's a slightly different um, proportion and a slightly different um, magnitude that we have, for example, for other platforms where Google, for example, has uh, a, a more significant uh, form of uh, using news but also a different form of distributing news, where news on Meta is distributed because publishers put it there. They want to reach more users. They want to earn revenue dollars and euros and pounds um, through the, the, the propagation of their content on our platform. Okay, so that would be, I think, one um, aspect, uh, potentially, of, of uh, answer to this question. Maybe there are other aspects, and that can be... Uh, discussed throughout uh, the rest of this conference and beyond. Um, bringing, uh, coming back to you, um, Marina, um, also in the session before, we had a number of organizations who presented their solutions on countering disinformation um, that had mainly to do with fact-checking, um, kind of then posting, you know, the... <coughs> The, the contrary um, uh, opinion. Um, and I was wondering if you could go into your perspective or into more detail on uh, facts and opinions and how those are interacting on social media. 
It's a bit diff difficult because the line is blurry sometimes. And most of all, laws cannot recognize this line. Neither can automatic processes. They don't recognize sarcasm. They don't recognize narratives, even narratives that are vile and dangerous. And that's why I believe that the law can never cover everything that is bad for society. The law should always be broader than community guidelines that um, constrain, uh, that, that make a safe community um, or a democratic community. That is why mod content moderation is important, of course. Um, you will never have a functioning platform without moderation. Um, also, it's yeah, you can have fact checking. It's very important um, and give additional sources. But in my experience, most of the people who share fake news don't share them because they don't know how to fact check or they don't have the media literacy to seek out a second source. They share fake news because they want to, because the narrative um, fits their purpose or their emotion. They have an emotional need to believe certain things. And that is why I think as a society, we underestimate the other realm that is countering uh, disinformation or um, dangerous narratives by working with the people who are vulnerable to them, uh, with youths who can be radicalized online, with older people. And all of them are people who fear to lose something, their position in society, um, their future, and they seek narratives because they think, oh, I have no control over my life, but someone has to have control over my life. And, and that's where anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories are born, uh, populism and so on. And I believe as societies, even in Europe, we don't do enough to um, actually meet disenfranchised people uh, to have equality not only in income um, but also in say and participation in networking um, and that could do loads of good for us as a society thank you very much i'm um, bringing this over to you michael how resilient do you think are our democracies us who we're all coming together here from the us from germany from france how sure can we actually be of our democracies? Well, I, you know, I think, again, Maria made a very good point. Um, what's happening in many cases with disinformation is it's resonating with people, not because they necessarily believe it in an objective way, but because they want to believe it, because it reinforces their identity, or because it's easier to believe when you're unhappy with something that's going on that it's a conspiracy rather than just bad luck or the way the world works. And so it's really a deeper set of social issues. And I think it comes to the question, first and foremost, of rebuilding trust in institutions. We've seen over the last maybe 10 plus years a variety of institutions coming into question. Um, for example, globalization from an economic standpoint which was widely promoted as a, an unalloyed good for the whole world, took a real hit in 2008 when there was a financial crisis. And actually, there are many people in parts of the world who think globalization isn't working for them, and that's an audience that uh, responds to this. In the health area, I think what we've seen, particularly with COVID, is some, um, shall we say, uncertainty in the messaging and therefore, people who are unhappy with or skeptical about science or don't want to engage in lockdowns, again, are looking for something that will tell them this is all a fake or somebody invented this in a lab somewhere in Wuhan. So ultimately, the systemic issues we're talking about require a more concerted, deliberate effort to educate, um, contrary to some of these conspiracy theories, let me give you one example of what works. You know, we've had over years radicalization in the U.S., particularly on the extreme right. But there have been circumstances where people who belong to extreme organizations finally concluded this was a big mistake. And then they went out and began to educate about why these organizations and these ideologies were not actually um, reasonable or appropriate or deserving of adherence. And that was a powerful voice. 
because they spoke from their actual knowledge. They could say, I've been there, I've done that, and let me tell you why it doesn't work. So uh, uh, um, a thoughtful, deliberate way of educating may be the, the medium to long-term solution to rebuilding trust. Thank you. And we um, have to bring this panel uh, to a close shortly. I have about um, five minutes actually on my clock uh, <laughs> still remaining. Um, so I want to uh, look into the future um, a little bit. Uh, you said already times of uh, break things are over, uh, Marcus. Moving fast, not so much. I would concur. I think there's uh, lots of people who say actually the race for the metaverse is on. So um, looking ahead, what lessons of the past years have been learned um, at Meta and how will those be implemented for uh, this next phase? Well, I, I just want to continue from the topic from trust. I think trust is um, people say data is the oil of the of the internet, which is wrong, by the way. But you know, I think trust is the oil, is the oxygen, is the currency of the current internet. And if we want to move to the next internet, the metaverse, trust is absolutely required. And I think that is an obligation on companies like us, but everybody else who who wants to um, you know engage in the in the next computing platform, in the internet 3.0, or whatever you want to call it. So very very important. And, and by the way, what we're discussing here are trust building exercises. Michael and Marina, both you, you made this point. You know, we need to te we deal with content information that is just violating that needs to go off the platform. We need to point out misinformation. We need to go after the people that are behind misinformation, the disinformation campaigns, and shut them down. These are all trust building exercises as a responsible societal operator. And then we have a responsibility and duty to think about the future, the future of the internet. Uh, the metaverse, in my view, not just as a meta employee, is the future. It's an absolutely new way of interacting three dimension in an embodied way, in an immersive way. I mean, that will really take us forward and create many opportunities and maybe embrace some of these opportunities to address some of the issues we have today. And I just leave the one thought where an internet that is much more embodied, where we are interacting with each other as we are, where we cannot hide behind a Twitter handle, hopefully is a more empathetic internet as well. And maybe some of these things that we see today might go away, but there might well be other issues that we cannot foresee today. And you know, this is, this is obviously the nature of technology. Thank you very much. And uh, I do have a real human uh, waving to me right now that um, <laughs> actually my clock not, doesn't seem to be the right one. I apologize for a somewhat abrupt uh, end of this panel now. Um, I th think we've uh, touched a number of issues and I, I think we will uh, continue to be talking about them um, over the course of this conference. We spoke about the significance of disinformation and how it actually unfortunately uh, works. We also understood that we won't be able to put this genie back in the bottle and that there is a lot that we need to do in addition uh, to make our democracies more resilient, like, for example, uh, getting our education system fit for purpose to have active local communities, uh, physical ones, as we are enjoying here as well, citizen participation uh, and free media. And I think that is also a good segue to this next session. Thank you very much uh, to you. the panelists. Thank you very much for your attention and for your questions. Thanks.